Venture Crowd, and I'm thrilled to be a host for this exciting chat this evening. We've only just allowed attendees to get into the waiting room, so I will give everyone just a second to uh, jump in. Um, but I'll just do a bit of a roundup of why we're here tonight. So we are going to take a deep dive into a topic, um, of course, that affects us all, uh, our health. Uh, specifically, we're discussing early detection and intervention in critical health events, a factor that could drastically change the course of diseases like cardiovascular ailments, which claim uh, about 30 million lives globally uh, each year. So tonight, uh, we're very lucky to hear directly from uh, two legends championing this space, uh, Mark Weber, former Formula One champion and, uh, of course, investor in Wear Optimo, and Professor Mark Kendall, founder of Wear Optimo. Now, before we get to the heart of this discussion, uh, let's shed some light on the ever-expanding micro-wearables sector. Uh, now, the wearable technology market has seen significant growth valued at over one, uh, sorry, 115.8 billion, that's a big number, um, in 2021. Now it's projected to expand further um, with a uh, CAGR of 14.6% from 2023, hitting an estimated 380 and a half billion by 2028. And with a broad utility and focused approach, where Optimo's platform has a total addressable market of a staggering 300 billion. Now that includes 19 billion in workplace health and safety, 12 billion in aged care, 146 billion uh, in cardiac monitoring and clinical trial management, 81 billion uh, in septus monitoring and immune information and 46 billion in insights and analysis uh, of analyzed data for pharmaceuticals uh, customers. Uh, now, every year, countless people die because critical health events like cardiac episodes are missed. Wear Optimo's patented micro wearable technology can do what no other wearable can do. It can go deeper and monitor, and also, of course, interpret critical health signals in real time, pain free, and continuously. So let's learn just a little bit uh, about Wear Optimo. Uh, Wear Optimo's innovative and patented technology has the potential to alert clinicians and patients to critical health events like heart attacks and severe dehydration and enable preventative measures that could save lives uh, and of course reduce health systems costs for everyone. And led by Professor Mark Kendall, Wear Optimo has world-class experienced high-performing team uh, backed by key investors, including the Australian National University, Aspen Medical, and of course our guest today, Mark Weber, nine-time Formula One Grand Prix winner. And Wear Optimo has also secured significant uh, non-diluting grant support from the Australian Federal Government and Queensland State Government. The company is uh, now on the cusp of key clinical studies for its first product, which is hydration monitoring, uh, and other significant product developments that will drive its technology platforms into rapid commercialization. Alrighty, so now it's uh, time to dive into our fireside chat and panel conversation uh, with uh, both Marks. Um, but before we do so, I'd like to remind the audience uh, that there is a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Yeah, now on your Zoom, you're going to see just a little bar down the bottom. It should say uh, Q&A. Please, as we're going throughout this webinar, if there's a question that pokes your interest, just type it in the Q&A function. We'll either get to that throughout the webinar um, or we will have time to answer your questions uh, at the end. But please uh, don't lose that question. Uh, it's bound to be important and we'll spur others uh, for people also on this webinar. Uh, of course, the uh, investment opportunity is currently live on the VentureCrowd platform at venturecrowd.com.au and has raised almost 1 million in applications from our crowd of investors. Okay, so without um, further ado, let's just introduce our uh, guests. Um, Mark Kendall, can you hear me? If you can give me a wave. Yep. Hi, Rebecca. Yep. Hi, Mark. And Mark Weber, thank you so much for joining us. If you could give us a wave as well. Yeah. Hi, Rebecca. Good morning from over here. Yeah. Good evening from over here. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> that's it. Actually, um, Professor Mark and myself are both in in Brisbane, just one suburb away, um, but uh, you're an ocean away. But uh, amazing that we yeah. can connect uh, via the internet. No worries. Yeah, no worries. Cool. 
So um, let's dive into uh, the heart of the discussion. And Mark uh, Weber, I would really like to start with you and give the audience uh, some background too as to why you're joining us this evening. Um, I mean, this is a big question, but <laughs> could you tell us, you know, a little bit of your life and give us, I suppose, some context for um, our investors that have not been in a Formula One car before. What's it like being a driver at that level? Uh, yeah, it's pretty well misunderstood, actually. It's, uh, it's a pretty demanding environment. Um, but yeah, I was lucky to race uh, racing cars for quite a long period. Um, turned professional when I was 18, retired when I was 38. Um, but yeah, raced Formula One for uh, 12 years and test driver before that. Um, so it is very, very surprising how physical uh, a Formula One car is purely because of the G loads um, and obviously mm. some of the the temperatures that we race in, of course, um, you know, Singapore, Malaysia, um, some extremely humid environments. Um, so the opportunity for us to uh, lose a lot of fluids um, and, of course, with a lot of adrenaline as well. Um, of course, it's a high risk sport as well. So there's lots of, um, I suppose, chemicals uh, going on in the cockpit that make it a pretty demanding environment for us um, mm. and for me. Uh, and, yeah, I think that you know, for, for me being slightly taller as well, um, <clears throat> people might think, well, how does that affect uh, your profession and how you go about things? But obviously installation for me in the car was not the most straightforward. Um, and, and I raced at 73 kilos. Um, and so hydration and understanding my weight control was absolutely pivotal with myself and the designers of the, of the car. So mm. that's how I got a bit nerdy and a bit geeky on uh, hydration and all things um, conditioning in sport. Yeah, I mean, I was reading, doing some reading today, Mark, that um, drivers can drop, um, you know, at two to three kilos, basically, um, in, be in between flags, um, mm. in a fireproof suit, uh, crammed in, into a cockpit, like you were just saying. Um, and basically, uh, I, I do want to read this out, actually, from this article, because I thought this gave me quite a good um, uh, analogy. Basically, you're, basically, you're inches apart from one another, with visibility not unlike poking your head um, out of a well. <laughs> And basically, yeah. um, such a crucial um, time to have to concentrate. You know, I mean, um, talking about hydration in, in that particular element, I, I understand you've also got a background in endurance events like cycling mm. in the French Alps, um, hiking in mountainous terrain. In your view, how crucial is hydration, not only in Formula One, but also in the other endurance events that you do? Could you share your experiences? Yeah, oh, it's absolutely critical, uh, Rebecca. I mean, preparation is absolutely king um, in the build-up to such events. Um, I did have some tough lessons early in my career about not preparing properly, um, hypotronemia in terms of getting too much water actually through the system, not having enough electrolytes in, in, in the situation in 2000. I raced in the Monaco Grand Prix there on a curtain razor and lost basically all cognitive function and ended up crashing. Um, so with absolutely horrendous preparation and just lack of education of what I needed to do. Um, so yeah, it's, it's important that we hydrate very, very cleverly. Um, and again, back in my day, when I first competing, even like, um, you know, uh, sort of saline drips and bags were available to use. I didn't use any of that stuff. I never wanted to go near that. I know some of my competitors did, but I stayed extremely traditional. Um, it was legal in our sport up until sort of the mid 2000s and it became illegal to use, um, you know, anything but from oral consumption. So it showed you how, what avenues medicine and drivers and teams were going to to try and find and respect elite performance around hydration in the cockpit. Um, and yeah, being a slightly bigger guy again, I would lose a lot of, um water uh and, and sweat a lot um so again just your salt intake and those things to make sure that the retention in, in your stomach for the water is is calculated correctly so you know there's a lot of science behind it um mm. and i think that without understanding that correctly which of course i went on a journey with um was very very important for for my performance and because i was prepared to put a lot of effort in so you know the, the conditioning side of my sport was something that wasn't a burden i really enjoyed that, that actually in terms of my, my fitness but i had to make sure that i coupled that with the smart Marts around being hydrated and, and you mentioned some of those other sports that I've done like you know nine hour mountain bike races um, at very high altitudes uh, in Colorado um, so you learn a lot about yourself at those altitudes extreme conditions um, so actually understanding how, not getting behind on the hydration status was just so so important for us if you get on that slippery slope you're behind um, then obviously it's very you, you already are you know you know, creeping into a, a subpar performance. Um, mm. And obviously if you get if you bottom right out, obviously the result can be can be absolutely horrendous. So um 
yeah, it's something which um, I've enjoyed. And again, just even your thermal regulation, you no know, skin folds. We were measuring my skin folds, eight sites with skin calipers, making sure that I was as lean as possible every two weeks to make sure that the leaner I am, you know, the, the cooler my body runs. So then my hydration status is easier to handle. So mm. we really were um, pretty cutting edge, actually, at the time. Um, mm. And a lot of that was out of Australia, actually, which I was, of course, very proud to say. And that's why, again, with where Optima, I like to sort of support the Aussie angle where I can. Um, mm. But, yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a subject that I'm comfortable talking about, one that I think I've been in the trenches and understood about how um, it go when it goes well and when it goes horrendous. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, it certainly sounds like um, you you have been on the cutting edge even back in the 2000s. I mean, um, Mark, uh, Professor Mark was uh, sharing with me before that on a Formula One car, there's thousands of sensors, yet none on humans. Why do you think um, that is and why has it taken, I suppose, to this time for us to um, be able to understand that the human is the, the person uh, in control yeah. in that particular sport? <laughs> Can you show your view on that? Yeah, uh, they're getting better at it, um, but, yeah, it's still... Uh, a bit of a gap absolutely that, that we understand the the, the vehicle or the, the sort of, it's an upside down jet effectively obviously these cars now as you say the amount of sensors and what they can measure the the inputs that we put into operating the car is extraordinary they can measure abs absolutely everything but obviously what we're going through is is quite is quite interesting we do a lot of offline testing obviously in terms of you know our you know our reflexes of course and how our eyes track things and obviously mm -hmm. formula one drives their peripheral vision for example is is absolutely extraordinary so we have incredible levels to consume information with with our eyesight um so there's things like that which they're across but in the fields and measuring on the fly um is still a bit of a lag i'd say um even for formula one um and mm -hmm. i think also because of fire i suppose you know we're getting there in terms of the, the the fireproof overalls and stuff just understanding having wearables on the skin is something which um you know, any jewellery or watches or wearables um, is still, you know, a bit of a no-no uh, in terms of, um, it's, it was in my day, I've been talking about watches and things like that, but in terms of really the right wearables, I think there's still totally a solution to take them into the field. Yep, absolutely. I mean, in, in regards to that, um, what do you think the gaps are um, or the issues, I suppose you've spoken about a couple, um, but in terms of the management of hydration, you know, not just in, in F1, but in other elite sports and, um, you know, potentially even in military settings? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a lot of um, good contacts and friends in that in that space as well um, at the elite level. And, and it's, again, something I've spoken to them about, about how, easy for them you know they're obviously in on missions for quite a long period of time and easy for them to get behind the curve as well and that does cloud judgment if that's you know it doesn't it doesn't matter what type of special force soldier you're getting behind on that stuff that can start to affect your performance so yeah. same for us um so yeah i think just trying to somehow you know have something exactly like like we have here um trying to measure um and give you the the, the absolute real-time data that, that where your status is at and obviously having the 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 data going into that knowing you know you, you need obviously some good historical um, data going into sort of how you're operating as an individual everyone you know ticks a bit differently clearly um but have that in there you know you could measure core body temperature we've done that you know I was, again i was measuring core body temperatures you know 15 years ago on the fly we were doing that um and so that was possible so with a pill you know obviously taking a small sensor um yes. Yes. swallowing that but in terms of um this i think that that is that is really the, the the most glowing and obvious gap where we don't respect enough and measure enough when we are you know when we can participate or competing or uh, participating um where our hydration status is mm, mm. now yeah, um, mark you're known for being selective with your brand affiliations so how do you decide which brands to align with well, for me, I think it's, I like to have good knowledge of what I get involved in. Like, I feel that this is something which I know um, how it affects people. Um, this is also relevant for my father, you know, who's just cruising around down in Queen, been doing his thing. He's just horrendous at hydration. He's out there outside all day and, you know, he yeah. doesn't do enough to, yeah. to look after himself. And then again, on the elite side of sport, you know, I've, I've spoken to the best sailors in the world, the best, some of the best soldiers in the world and, you know, Yesterday, I was down at Queen's at the tennis, talking to the top tennis players in the world. So, um, you know, I know um, and I enjoy um, that that setting. And, and so for me to be involved in something where people are uh, more comfortable about competing and preparing better and measuring better and the smarts around that, I, I, I feel good about that, that I can be involved in something where, because I've been on the side where it was pretty archaic and it wasn't overly enjoyable. It wasn't a very enjoyable experience. So if I can stop people going through that, 
Um, yeah, but yeah, I'll get, of course, approaches um, for lots of different projects um, and some which, yeah, naturally I, I have no real interest in seeing them do particularly well uh, for lots of different reasons. But this one, of course, I want to see do really well. Mm, awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And um, how did you first come to know about Where Optimo? Um, I was actually at, a, at a, a function, a tennis event, um, and Mark was there and, um, yeah, he mentioned it to me. And, um, yeah, so it was a grand slam. I think it was the Australian Open the first time, wasn't it, Mark, um, that we met yeah. so uh, a few years ago. And, um, yeah, so I was there as a guest of Rolex. I'm an ambassador for Rolex. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah, we got talking and, it, yeah, here we are. Here we are. Awesome. And um, I've just got a final question before I want to move in across to uh, Professor Mark. Um, what compelled you to invest in Where Optimo and to uh, join this particular business as a strategic partner? I mean, of course, from the, the experience and probably lifetime experience of, of managing your hydration. Yeah. Yeah. And also I like the, the Aussie spirit against, um, you know, taking okay. on the perceived, um, you know, I've done this myself in my own life, uh, mm. left, left Australia and taking on um, what is, you know, on paper when I left was obviously mission impossible. Um, but you soon realize that there's, there's huge opportunities and the way we look at things, I think our level of enthusiasm and passion. Um, and, you know, in some ways, Australians nearly have a bit of a paranoid perfection. We want to do things so well and we want to overplease and do things really well. And I like that. Some of the qualities that we have that think, are we going to be accepted with certain projects and how's this going to land overseas? And, mm -hmm. and we're looking for that validation. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I, when I when I heard about, you know, of course, the Brizzy Base Company and, mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's just nice that we, this is all encompassing. You know, this is, this has no boundaries of where, you know, where this, um, you know, product can be used. Um, of course, in the space we just mentioned naturally, but, um, yeah, and there's obviously Mark will probably talk to the other, the other where you know the segues or other other you know once we get you know the hydration nailed um, is what where what else and where else um, you know where Optimo's smarts can can lean into. That's cool. Absolutely, yeah. Well, we'll ask you for some more uh, more real world insights about um, where Optimo's micro wearables um, after we introduce Mark because I think. Um, now it's time to, I suppose, for Professor Mark to understand. Um, well, we've known how you how you uh, first uh, cross paths in the Australian uh, Open, but can you share a little bit more, probably, uh, Professor Mark, about um, that interaction and um, you know uh, how you, I suppose, uh, became to be aligned? Yeah, so uh, we're, we're both broadly within the, the Rolex family. Uh, so Mark's that Rolex don't really use often the term ambassador, but um, there's not really a label for it, but uh, we're within that that particular group. And my my entry into that was um, winning a Rolex Award for Enterprise some time ago, mm. and um, and so as a result of that, as as Mark mentioned before, uh, we we saw each other at tennis and wide ranging conversation, many things. Uh, I think we talked about e cars, and uh, Mark was developing the Taycan at the time, uh, the Porsche Taycan, which. Mm -hmm. uh, was a, was a great discussion and he turned to just ask about what I was doing and walked him through that and uh, and some time passed and uh, we were doing a, a, a funding round last year and um, I reached out to Mark and yeah, here we are. Awesome. Um, now, how did you envisage, um, Mark, I suppose, this strategic partnership playing out? Um, I mean, it must have taken some time, I suppose, to get to know each other and um, understand uh, the benefits that each brought to each other. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, uh, I, I see it as a, a, a progression. So uh, there's um, a recognition that uh, that Mark, Mark Webb is uh, very busy on the world stage doing things in many different settings. And so it's not a, a high volume of time thing from, from mm. him. But, but it's hard won expertise on the world stage competing at the highest level and um, in elite sports. And so that's just that knowledge base is so, so, so powerful. When you consider right now, we're actually doing clinical testing with our, our hydration microwearable sensors with high level athletes in an environmental chamber. That's mm -hmm. our starting point, but we'll be moving into many different settings and it makes so much sense to work with elite athletes in the first instance, because they're the most motivated cohorts mm. of individuals that people talk about going after the extra one percent uh, advantage uh, 
Mark, I, I don't even know what the number would be in F1, but it'd be like the, the double o point double o triple o one percent would, would would be the difference between winning and losing, right? So yeah, uh, thousands, yeah, thousands, thousands, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, they're highly made of, motivated for that that particular edge. So uh, Mark has deep insight into that space and the world stage, and um, is already providing us advice and guidance on this, and um, that's tremendous. Mm. Uh, and and the rest, there's other things that flow from this as well. But that's that's the the primary bit. Um, mm. One thing that resonates from me is listening to Mark and and how he talks about uh, how his journey is the importance of high performing teams and having the right people around you and performing at just the the the, the best possible level. And um, we're, we're here in Brisbane by choice. Uh, we we could have we're Optimo. We could have done it elsewhere i could have gone back to europe uh silicon valley or geneva wherever mm. but we're doing it here by choice but we uh, we have a high performing team and it's something that we we, we don't take for granted and um but so, so th there's a strong resonance of values there as well mm -hmm. and just talking about that um professor mark can you uh, tell us or i suppose just give us a bit of an insight as to why you started where optimo in the first place. I always like to ask this question of, of founders. Um, I find there's uh, often a moment or, or two that will lead you to change your life path and, you know, put all your financial um, uh, um, uh, elements into this particular business, basically put your life into um, an idea. Can you share that with us? Yeah. Uh, there's a couple of things that took place more or less at the same time that led to it. Uh, the primary one was um, one of my family members uh, had a heart attack and um, I remember arriving at the hospital and seeing what that individual went through uh, and just the lack of useful information in real time. And just I just thought in this day and age, I just could not believe uh, that that was going on. Mm. And it had some significant consequences. Now, fortunately, the outcome for that family member is fine, but then you hear mm. of so many other stories of where it hasn't played out that way. Mm. And it just still blows my mind that... Um, People are dropping dead from heart attacks without any prior notice. While well, in some cases, if you just have a bit of prior information, uh, the treatment could be as simple as taking an aspirin. So mm. I just that's unbelievable. So mm. uh, so that happened. And then you think, okay, so what, what can we do about that? Well, around the same time, uh, these earlier versions of these came out, uh, the Apple Watch. So I can see suddenly wearables yeah. were becoming a, a massive, massive area. But I knew immediately because of my science domain knowledge of tech in the space and the skin that these were always going to be completely limited at gaining access to the signals that matter. Mm. So I was using that deep domain knowledge to then come up with uh, micro wearables as a way of gaining access to those signals. So it's a few of those things sort of playing out at the same time. I think Rolex played a bit of a role too. So uh, by, by winning uh, a Rolex award for enterprise, um, it it opened up my thinking in some different ways beyond classically how we think in Australia. So uh, mm. some of those uh, touch points that Mark referred to. So you've won an award for enterprise. So if you want to do it, go out and build an enterprise and make it happen. Uh, so it provided a source. And it, there's other sources of encouragement, but it was a, a key source of encouragement. Mm. You've just got to go out and do it. Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously there's a lot of, real world knowledge um, and insight um, that Mark brings, Mark Weber brings, um, how much is that incorporated into your business and brand? I know you, you know, it, it seems, um, Professor Mark, that you were um, intuiting that basically the, you've kind of, you almost went in a, a, a different direction, not just cardiac, but the hydration monitoring. Um, was that a kind of a key turning point for where Optimo? So yeah, let me let me outline our game plan, if you like, mm -hmm. or a strategy. Please. So uh, we've we've talked about uh, hydration, we've talked about cardiac. Mm. So both both are massive areas of unmet need. So what I do know is that this field's moving really quickly, and we've got to play quickly. Otherwise, don't play at all. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the cardiac mic wearable massively important, but because of the nature of it, you're dealing literally with life and death stuff. It'll take us a little bit longer to, to get there. So we thought, right, what do we do? So it turns out that hydration is a massive area of unmet need. Uh, the way it's currently done, Mark, Mark Weber talked about lag in the data. So it's mm. in some cases as literally as rudimentary as a, a poster on the wall asking you what color your pee is. 
Now, if you get to that point and your pee is bright orange, well, you are gone. And it's going to take you a long time before you, you're rehydrated again. It's not something you can click your fingers to, to do. But that, that's how, it, how it's currently done. And uh, so our minimum viable product is hydration. It's still a massive area of unmet need. Uh, and so we're, we're beginning with that particular product. Uh, that's where our clinical trials are at this point. Public mm -hmm. capital and a few other assumptions, uh, uh, that product will be on the market within the next few years. Mm -hmm. And then we move on to the next areas and the next areas. Uh, mm. That gives you a high level summary of uh, our methodology. Mm. And in regards to this current capital raise, um, what will, uh, you've indicated a, um, basically a high level summary. Can you give us a bit more detail basically about what uh, that this raise will be used for? So we've just commenced our human clinical studies. They're really important studies where uh, proving out the science in a definitive way to produce the world's first and only uh, definitive hydration wearable sensor that actually genuinely measures hydration. Uh, so the investment that we're, we're putting together at this point in time uh, will take us forward to achieving that, that milestone uh, we'll, over the next six to nine months, there or thereabouts. It will also allow us to get beyond the where we are right now, which is a particular environment uh, at Queensland University of Technology in a high-performing lab get beyond that lab environment into broader, broader settings. So um, uh, elite sports settings is one example and a few others as well. Uh, that's, that's a couple of examples of what we're doing, but it's essentially the next phase of growth towards our product and sales to get our sensors out there. It's to get our sensors a lot closer to looking like this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, while at this point in time, uh, they're a lot, lot, they're an earlier stage approach and moving on to this generation. So. We'll go from here to here in the next few months and then onwards on to something a bit more like that. I mean, we spoke about the size of the market before and I feel, um, you know, like for myself, um, this is my, I don't think you can see that on the screen, but that's my um, wearable. I We're so uh, used now, and I think getting more used to understanding the data that our bodies put out um, just with uh, a wearable do you think, I mean, I've got my own view, but do you think that the um, ad adoption of these micro wearables, you know, what's your view on how long that will take for people to um, actively uh, uh, engage and for them to be as common as now the Apple Watch? So we're stepping through that. So our, our starting point is business to business. So take an example of um, the mining and resources sector or the military sector. So these are these are environments that the employer is subjecting the staff member or employee to that can be adverse conditions, hot, humid, difficult conditions. They're sending them out into the field. So they have a duty of care to look after them in the best way possible. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we're positioning our micro wearable to be part of that narrative. Uh, so uh, to be part of the best in practice PPE to look after the individual. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's the beginning. And then we, we step out more broadly uh, beyond that in, in different settings. So ultimately it will become more of a consumer thing, broader, broader scale. But before mm -hmm. then, uh, let's be clear, we're producing something massively valuable. This has this thing, this kind of thing hasn't been done before. Mm -hmm. uh, the concept of uh, a genuine hydration index. So uh, so we're deploying that in the most uh, appropriate way through different markets. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, it certainly sounds like there are uh, many addressable markets. What I want to cover just briefly is just that um, needle. I know you mentioned this um, in the uh, information memorandum and also, of course, on the deal page. But just that, that the, the needle, I suppose, just goes into that um, top layer of um, epidermis and that is uh, pain-free. Basically, many people are worried about needles um, and, of course, wearing um, one on their skin. Can you give us a little bit more of an indication of how that works? Yeah, sure. Uh, so if you apply it to the skin, uh, as I have now, just now, uh, the sensation is, it feels like very thin grade Velcro, if mm. that makes sense. So it does. it's not the sensation of a needle at all. It's a continu continually, it's a, it's a pain-free experience. And and that that pulls on my, my deep domain knowledge and others within our team uh, mm. in this particular space. Uh, so I've been working with the skin for about 25 years and mm. um and we're using that domain knowledge to um, produce this stealth-like experience uh, for how that sensor works against the skin. 
But to give you context about the team, uh, we have about 30 people within the business. And uh, I'd say probably about 20 of them have PhDs. And I'm not saying that a PhD is the only measure of life. There's, there's smarts that we've done in many different ways, but it's giving you a little bit of a feeling of the, the caliber of what we've built uh, here in Brisbane. Mm, that's fantastic. I, I mean, certainly um, I agree with that uh, in regards to the number of PhDs, but to go to that level um, and do that level of study, um, you've got some very smart people uh, involved in where off now. So congratulations. Um, there is a question here from Gemma. She's asking, are you talking to any wearable companies? Um, I do all my research with the Whoop device. I'm not familiar with that one, um, but I'd love to see an integration in the future. Can you comment on that, Professor Mark? Of course. Uh, so we're, we're talking with all parts of the market, right? So we're talking with uh, wearable manufacturers, parties interested in that particular space, uh, and then people that make wearables uh, as well. And then we're also talking beyond that, uh, we're talking with customers. So and we're talking with the mining industry customers. Uh, we're, we're talking with elite athletes. Uh, so uh, we've got to, to master this. We, we need to, to talk and we also need to listen uh, in many, many different areas. So uh, the short answer is, uh, yep, uh, we're under NDA with, with many. I can't disclose it in this, this particular setting, but uh, yeah, you need to get out in the field and you need to learn. You need to talk, but you also need to listen. Mm, absolutely. Uh, it certainly sounds like um, listening is um, where, um, for yourself, Mark Kendall, where Mark Weber comes in and can provide um, that information, having been at that um, at that elite level. Um, Gemma is also asking, how difficult would this be to incorporate other biomarkers, such as cortisol, into your device? Yeah, I really like that question. So something I haven't talked about is just how special the skin is and what we're unlocking with it. So mm. skin's an amazing organ. Uh, it, it does its job. We're alive today. That means it's doing its job. So that means it's keeping the bad stuff out and the good stuff in on the whole. Uh, but when you get just into this layer of the skin uh, that, that I've talked about, it's a rich reservoir of so many different types of biomarkers. Now, yes, we've talked about two things today. We've talked about cardiac biomarkers and we've talked about hydration. Both are really important areas in their own right. If we had infinite resources and infinite time, there's about 23 different things we could go after. We could go after, uh, so women's health, uh, fertility hormones mm -hmm. as one example. So knowing in real time exactly when you're in, in that particular zone or whatever it is that you need to be in that mm -hmm. zone for. Mm -hmm. uh, coming on to Gemma's particular question, so cortisol, uh, mental health biomarkers, so orexin A, cortisol, uh, they're, they're, they matter in so many different settings and um, they're present within that location within the skin and our platform is um, well suited to doing that. And there's many others uh, in that go out there. You talk to uh, elite athlete coaches or doctors and uh, I won't name one, but um, as a mutual friend of, of Mark and, and mine, and he keeps asking me about um, lactate, continuous lactate monitoring. Please, please come up with that. And I said, yeah, it's on the list. We were able to do it. Uh, we, we just don't have the, um, we've got to focus right now. But um, so the short answer is there's, there's, there's a, a, a massive range of opportunities, uh, but at the same time, uh, we need to focus. Mm. And what is your focus? Um, could you tell us for the next year um, and then moving to five and 10 years, if you could give us an overview or give investors an overview? Okay. Next year is uh, we've commenced clinical studies uh, and we're running through those loops and it's to, to pull out the definitive, in the first instance, uh, binary hydration index, so hydrated or not, and then going to the definitive, what we call the sliding scale hydration index, which is almost like traffic lights, red, orange, green, but also where, which direction you're heading at the, that mm. time as well. That's, that's where we're heading within the next 12 months is to do that definitively. And I should say uh, one important part of our team of what we're doing with our sensors is we're, we're pulling out high quality signals, but about a third of our business is our data analytics AI team. So it's pulling out those signals and getting that picture together for that hydration index. So that's a critical thing at the same time. Uh, we're engaging with the field. We're doing this uh, in some cases through our, uh, another strategic partner, which is Aspen Medical. 
mm -hmm. uh, working with the, the field settings for the mining, energy resource, and also the military sector. So we're starting to configure our product, uh, its form factor that's suitable for those particular settings. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a couple of uh, critical focal points. I should say one extra one uh, that's important is the cardiac micro wearable. And right now we've, we have initial proof of concept out of the body. Now we'll be doing it on the body, uh, but it won't be on the body of a human. You can imagine heart attack trials, there's a, there's a bit more involved in doing it than, than hydration. Yeah. So we'll be doing it with a large animal model. And uh, it just so happens that that animal model that um, is used is the sheep. Uh, so we'll be working with uh, uh, the sheep model to really prove that sensor in that setting, which is will be highly valuable before going to the, the next level of humans. Mm. Um, Clive asked a, a question you touched just on AI before, and Clive's asking uh, the recent announcement by Google where they solved the problem uh, with advanced AI. How does the micro, micro wearable fit into this space? Is there a chance for a potential exit or partnership? Have you given that um, some thought, Professor Mark? Of course, yeah. So AI is an interesting uh, soup of the day. It's uh, become mm -hmm. very very, you know, it's become a big, very big topic. Uh, so I've already touched on uh, how we're deploying deep data machine learning and AI within our business. These are amazingly talented people using the best tools in the shed with intellectual property that we've created and protected as we have a pattern state of uh, 35 people. Uh, but you know what, in the end, it's, it's not easy, but it's simple. And it's simple in the sense is, what you get out of the back end is totally dependent on the quality of the signals that come in at the front end. Mm. And if you have high quality, unique signals at the start, then what you get at the end is going to be so much better. And so that's what we're doing uh, mm. with, our, with our insights, with our sensors, producing those unique quality signals that makes what we produce at the back end with uh, our data analytics and AI mm. so much more powerful than what everyone else is doing. Mm. So yeah, uh, we're, we're in discussions with uh, the kind of parties that have been named, as you would expect, we're under NDA with them. Mm. Uh, you know, one minute you're a competitor, the next you're a collaborator and, uh, you know, people then get purchased. So those sorts of things are possible. Uh, but we've, yeah. we've got plenty of work to do though. Mm. I think um, back to um, Mark Weber. Um, Mark, can you um, share, I suppose, We've talked a little bit about your insights and your experience um, in F1 and other endurance sports previously, but what are the, I suppose, the overarching insights, the real world um, insights in terms of uh, use that you're able to bring to Wear, Opto, uh, Wear Optimus micro wearable technology? Well, I think it's, as, as Mark touched on, I think using our bullets wisely, making sure that we are, um, you know, obviously very, targeted on on what we're we're trying to achieve here i think that's that's important um you know i've worked with engineers all my life um mm -hmm. and then i'm 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 the end user so at red bull racing for example we have 1200 engineers and i'm the last guy that uses the product so yeah. um and i want the product always to be better and and easy to predict and you know obviously interpretation of data as well that's very good you know as we just touched on you know sensors can do this sensors can read that but actually interpretation and correlation for consistency so the trust for the consumer to make sure actually what i'm measuring here is actually bang on mm. so all those type of topics are important for me because you know if i'm effectively you know racing this car at, you know 370k an hour it needs to be pretty uh, i need to trust it um, mm. and that's obviously trust again obviously i haven't worked in the medical field but obviously our industry is still um you know it's pretty it's pretty rigorous in terms of how and what gets onto cars at right periods of time so um you know, I, I suppose I'm, I could be frustrating for Mark and the team and I, and I am with racing drivers in general, I'm with engineers because we want things obviously always faster and always quicker and, and understanding things. So I just, I find that level of enthusiasm that we can bring and try and, um, yeah, I suppose just jolt them in a really positive way. And that's been met with, by the way, with, with, with great, with great enthusiasm, sort of actually, how do we, you know, and, but the medical side is another beast altogether. Look, I completely admit that obviously it's, it's, it actually is a, a whole a different juggernaut but um, I'm really enjoying where I can um, you know just again it is it's the it's the commercialization it's actually trying to understand how you know my buddies in the military as I say uh, mining my father um, mm. you know school kids school mm. kids whatever kids at school you know they get behind hot environments our country as we know is very split and Australia's a brilliant it's a brilliant demographic to um, 
you know, and, and location uh, uh, because of the demands of our country, you know, particularly in the summer months, um, mm. you need to be on top of this. Um, mm. It's not like we're trying to launch this in, in Oslo. Oslo is a bit less demanding. Um, so it's a great country to, to challenge this and you can take it all around the world. Absolutely. I suppose just carrying on from that, what, what makes you believe in Where Optimo's vision? Well, I think that uh, I, I've worked with a lot of, the, again, young Australian engineers, young people coming into our industry. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm positive in the fact that, you know, we do have a high bar in Australia in terms of understanding if it's medicine, if it's, uh, you know, when we give things a, a red hot crack. Uh, Mark has travelled. He's international. He's universally understands the forces that are out there. Mm -hmm. um, I get it's not an absolute total slam dunk. You know, this is not like, you know, it's, it's, it, it's going to take some work. Um, of course, I've, I've, I've put my weight in behind it um, with my own, with my own uh, money as well. Um, so I, of course I want it to work. I believe it'll work. Um, it's going to be the one team to, to get that done. And I, I, and I think that again, you know, back in the young Australian spirit to, to have a, to give this space a red hot crack um, in the right environment, because it's under our nose. It's actually, I think it's really important to, trial and have such technology that is very uh it's, it's extremely sympathetic to to our location where we are and it's, mm. it's 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 i know you know if you're in canberra today i don't know where all the callers are calling you from australia but if you're from hobart to canberra i know it's a bit nippy but there's things where and by the way you get dehydrated even without not being in hot right. temperature of course yeah, you yeah. get dehydrated on a long flight for example you know again from mm. australia we're always doing long flights so i draw i draw confidence from the fact that um, I think the location is good. The energy with it, with with, it, with the young people is good, and I've seen it so many times in my own industry where young Australians can really do some great things. Mm. Thank you very much for that, Mark. Um, we are, have a few minutes left, and there are still some questions that are coming through. So um, I'd like to, I suppose, just wrap up this panel discussion and then move um, more onto the questions. So. Uh, to our audience, if you do have uh, burning questions, now's the time to put them in the Q&A button. Um, now, I just will, while you're doing that, uh, recap our investment opportunity that we have to hand. So we are looking at a 300 billion micro wearables and devices market opportunity. It's a massive market, as uh, Professor Mark and uh, Mark have outlined uh, over the last hour. Uh, where Optimo stands out in this space with a significant competitive advantage bolstered by 35 patents filed. I think that's very important for investors to note. Um, backed by key investors such as the Australian National University and Aspen Medal, uh, Medical and, of course, uh, Mark uh, Weber tonight, Where Optimo is primed for significant strides in this space. Uh, for our wholesale uh, investors, this is the chance to become part of Where Optimo's growth story. So, we're enabling investors to participate in an ordinary share round at $1.75 per share, uh, based on a pre-money valuation of $50 million AUD. Uh, now, the company's already raised $16 million, uh, 16, sorry, million in equity and $16 million in non-dilutive grant funding. Yep. Uh, current round, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, which has already raised almost a million via our platform, Venture Crowds platform. Uh, it gives investors the unique opportunity to join we're Optimo before the forthcoming clinical trial results. I think that's important for investors getting in at this particular round to note, uh, which could potentially trigger a significant valuation uplift in the next round. Um, now, uh, we'll get to those questions, uh, but just also I'd like to just launch a quick poll. You'll see that now um, on your screen if you can fill that in just while we are answering these questions. Um, now, Alan's saying, uh, hi, Mark, hydration is an enormous issue in all forms of healthcare. Uh, do you see um, the initial market being in high performance sport or within the healthcare system or another? We've spoken about a couple. Yep. Right? Could you uh, elaborate, Professor Mark? Uh, so Cal's right. Uh, so it is an enormous issue in many different directions. So it's not just if you're in the field, hydration is a massive issue. Um, in, in the hospital settings. Mm. There's one example uh, where Optimo commissioned a study at uh, Adam Brooks Hospital in Cambridge in the UK, and we had uh, leading intensivists uh, go in and, and be interviewed and look at the end-to-end -end for how people are treated when, they're, when they go into hospital. So what happens when you go in the hospital setting is they put you on a drip straight away, mm. irrespective of whatever your, your hydration level is. 
And you might be thinking, what's the problem if you put too much fluid in? But as, as Mark Weber talked about before, uh, if you have too much fluid, uh, it can actually cause a lot of problems for your cognitive function and actually kill you. People can die, die from that. Mm. So uh, there's many different applications in a hospital setting when you first arrive in hospitals, but also in neurology as well when your kidneys are not working as, as well. So it's been hit and miss so far. The doctors need to sort of do this and estimate what they need to do in terms of the, the level of drip management. If you have a real-time sensor just telling you exactly what your hydration level is, that, that can be massive. So how we're tackling that, uh, Rebecca, is we're starting uh, with those markets I was talking about before, uh, the mining, energy resources, military sector, but we move into aged care and then we move into uh, the kind of areas that Callum was talking about, which is um, um, in the hospital settings and in intensive care uh, settings in the first instance. Mm. but rolled up hydration alone yeah there's massive massive markets and massive areas of unmet need mm. thank you very much um and hopefully that answered uh, your question callan um kai uh popped a question in about 15 minutes ago about the uh, potential for other biomarkers um and the unmet needs I think we have covered that, but what I thought was fascinating, uh, Professor Mark, in did you say that there were uh, 30 or 30 plus other biomarkers um, in the skin that you could... Uh, About 23, uh, 23 but the, the, list, the list continues to grow, uh, so it's, it's a massive list. Yeah, and how do you pick up, how do you understand what's available um, from the uh, dermis or what's about the data that's available to pick up? So... Yeah, we, we've, we of course, slithered out our kind of technical deep domain knowledge. So uh, we've been studying this for many years. I've supervised PhD students in this space and worked in this area. We're coming off the back and, uh, every, like, each person in our business have, have their journey. Uh, so my chief technology officer, Dr. Anthony Brewer, he started at Cambridge University and had worked with me before in my previous company and is doing a great job here leading that. And there's others that have that kind of journey. In my particular case, uh, rolled up a couple hundred journal articles I've published in the space of skin and sensing and putting things in and taking things out, the fundamentals of the skin. So that's deep, hard one knowledge. And then on top of that, doing useful things with that. So uh, one measure of that is the patents that we've filed. So for me, I've invented 150 patents. And then there's the value for investors that have been generated from that. So investors on the whole, pretty happy with what I've worked on. Uh, $2 billion of value has been generated from investors so far. Mm. Now that's ironically not my driver. Uh, my driver is doing something really useful that people care about in the matter of healthcare. All the rest is byproducts, mm. but different parties have different points of view and it's important to articulate what those look like. Mm. Yeah, I think that is um, really important, actually, to understand Professor Mark and, um, you know, uh, at the end of the day, uh, there are founders out there with ideas that are changing the world and making a difference to the people uh, that live uh, in this particular environment. So um, we would love to see where Optimo succeed and um, continue and, of course, um, provide uh, a service um, to uh, the people that you uh, go to work for every day. Rebecca, um, there's just one extra thing, if that's okay, can, if I can jump in. Yeah. Um, what, one thing I forgot to mention is um, when you asked about what we're doing in the next uh, 12 months, I, everything I said is accurate, but I forgot to, to add one important thing. Mm. Uh, so shortly, we'll be commencing a really significant grant, uh, multi-million dollar uh, grant. We have about $10 million that... Um, uh, is ready to be deployed and all of its non-diluting funding, it's by competitive grant processes, we'll be commencing uh, that deployment of that capital and that will be to stand up a facility based here in Brisbane for process development to lead to making about 20 million micro wearables per year. Mm. That will be here in Australia. And I think that's quite attractive uh, for investors because uh, that de-risks uh, additionally what we're doing. Mm. And it's it's all non-diluting capital as, as well. Mm. Thank you very much, Mark. I appreciate uh, you sharing that. And, of course, if anyone uh, from tonight's webinar or watching this recording uh, has any other questions, please uh, do email us, hello, adventurecrowd.com.au, um, or you can simply go to the website and submit your question there. 
Um, Mark Weber, thank you very much for joining us. Um, I appreciate your time this morning. That's okay. No worries. Thanks for turning it on and off. Every now you had someone just had to come and collect a helmet. So uh, yeah, oh. I had to uh, give that to them. It was in the wrong room. It was in his office. So uh, yeah, sorry about that. But um, no, I've enjoyed uh, I've enjoyed the chat this morning. And uh, yeah, I hope um, yeah people enjoyed it as well. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark Weber. And the beauty of the internet, uh, I find everything happens um, kind of uh, work, working from home these days. Um, but also, Mark Weber, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time and your insight um, into what Where Optimo is up to in the current capital race as well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, guys. All the best. Ciao. Thank you, everyone, thank you, for joining us. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, Thanks for being part of the journey. Um, we will be sending out a copy of the webinar to all attendees. Uh, please feel free to call us if you have any questions uh, at all. And of course, that's it for from me uh, for tonight. Have a great evening. Mm -hmm.